Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the annual Gittner Family College of Arts and Sciences lecture. I'm Stan Sklaroff, and I'm the interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. And I'm delighted to see you all here. I'm particularly pleased to welcome Jerry Gittner back to campus again for this occasion. Jerry Gittner, class of 66, graduated with a BA in history and was elected Phi Alpha Theta, the National History Honor Society. Jerry and his family have been generous and engaged members of the BU community for many years. Jerry is a trustee emeritus of Boston University and a current member of both the CAS and the Party School Dean's Advisory Boards. The annual Gittner Family Lecture is designed to highlight current BU faculty members whose teaching and research addresses topics of major importance for the broad interest and benefit of the BU community. For our fourth Gittner Lecture, we are presenting a panel discussion on a crisis that has greatly impacted a number of communities across the country, including many right here in Massachusetts. We will have a question and answer session afterwards, um, and I'm going to, and we'll give our panelists a chance to share their perspectives. Let me introduce our panelists to get things started. Susan Mizrocki is a William Aerosmith Chair in the Humanities and Director of the, the BU Center for the Humanities. She has been working between disciplines throughout her career, earning BAs in both history and English from Washington University in 1981, and her PhD in English from Princeton University in 1985. Since coming to Boston University in 1986, she has focused on the intersection of social, religious, and literary studies. Her specialties are American literature and film, religion and culture, literary and social theory, literary history, and history of the social sciences. Richard Sates is professor at Boston University Schools of Medicine and Public Health. He is also chair of the Director of Community Health Services at the School of Public Health. He is editor emeritus of Addiction Science and Clinical Practice. He's the senior editor of the Journal of Addiction Medicine and associate editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Dr. Sates is also a general internist and primary care physician and an addiction medicine specialist. He has been on the faculty at BU since 1993, but he's actually been a, a BU at BU much longer than that because he's a double terrier. <laughs> he's a graduate of both CAS and the medical school. Benjamin Siegel is an assistant professor of history. He's an historian whose transnational archival work places South Asia at the center of global economic, environmental, and bodily transformations. His first book, Hungry Nation, Food, Famine, and the Making of Modern India, interrogates the ways in which questions of food and scarcity have structured Indian citizens' understanding of welfare and citizenship since independence. His current project, Markets of Pain, American Bodies and Indian Drugs in an Age of Distress, is a global history of the American opioid crisis. He earned his BA at Yale and his MA and PhD at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Thank you, Stan, for that introduction. Like other public crises, the opioid epidemic has yielded many stories and narratives. Dope sick, painkiller, dreamland, clean, hillbilly elegy, to name a few of the nonfiction bestsellers. There is also much noteworthy fiction and poetry by, among others, Russell Banks, Tao Lin, Cheryl Reed, William Brewer, and Raphael Campo. There are testimonials by those who survived struggles with addiction and by those who didn't, and also by their families. There are memoirs by doctors who were themselves addicted or who regret their past prescribing habits. There are photographic essays featuring hard-hit neighborhoods such as Kensington in Philadelphia 
and coloring books to engage those suffering from addiction in therapy and learning. What I'd like to draw our attention to today is a narrative about addiction that I see as both democratic and epic. This narrative captures the lives of ordinary figures as they come into contact with the manufacture, trafficking, and consumption of drugs at a time in the history of our nation when addiction is soaring toward crisis proportions. My example is David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest. Wallace's novel is exceptional in its self-conscious traditionalism and in its creation of characters who are both typical and larger than life. The subject of addiction here becomes the avenue for probing the state of society and the general condition of the US citizenry. The work also displays multicultural awareness. Wallace presents his fictional worlds as distinct parts of a diverse nation. A temptation of the literature on addiction, and such temptations predate Thomas de Quincey's 19th century classic, Confessions of an English Opium Eater, is a reliance on neat polarities. A life dominated by drugs is either romantic or liberating or deviant and pathological. Memoir writers rely on winner-loser paradigms, whether featuring a survivor who triumphs over drug dependency or a Job-like sufferer who loses the battle. Given the magnitude of our crisis, it makes sense to seek narrative comfort in what is familiar and clarifying. But deeper understanding lies elsewhere. David Foster Wallace was a leading writer of the contemporary US canon. According to LA Times book editor David Ulin, Wallace, quote, quote brought ambition, a sense of play, a joy in storytelling, and an exuberant experimentalism of form back to the novel, and restored the notion of the novel as a kind of canvas on which a writer can do anything. New York Times columnist Frank Bruni wrote that, quote, Wallace is to literature what Robin Williams or perhaps Jim Carrey is to live comedy a creator so maniacally energetic and amused with himself that he often follows his riffs out into the stratosphere where he orbits all alone. Wallace struggled for, for, from his teen years with alcoholism as well as drug addiction and went through a legendary rehabilitation in Boston area facilities so recently that some clinicians and even former residents remember him. Thus, addiction as portrayed in Infinite Jest is an inside narrative inspired by experience, but structured as an exploration of the psychology, social norms, and political and economic circumstances underlying the growing national addiction problem. Like Herman Melville, who in Moby Dick presents the New England whaling industry as key to 19th century American culture, Wallace in Infinite Jest presents addiction and the system that enables it as key to US culture in the 1990s, which we can recognize in 2018 as prophetic. <clears throat> Set in Boston in many of the local neighborhoods, Alston, Brighton, Cambridge, abutting Boston University, the novel represents addiction through both individual characters and the institutions that seek their rehabilitation. Wallace captures particularities as well as trends, detailing the rituals that define social relations in different contexts, from the banks of the Charles River where homeless persons who use opioids live, to the private boarding schools where high achieving young drug users work and play, to the rehabilitation centers where almost everyone ends up. For Wallace, speech expresses who we are and have the potential to be. So the novel is a chorus of monologues, dialogues, and lingos, sometimes vital, sometimes deadening, favored by street people and students, patients, doctors, friends, and family. In short, all those whose lives are affected by narcotics, which is to say, everyone. <laughs> 
It is important to recognize how Wallace's personal success informs his understanding of addiction. An accomplished teenage tennis player, a top student at elite schools, graduating summa cum laude from Amherst, he later attended graduate school in philosophy at Harvard. His Amherst senior thesis in English became his first novel, The Broom of the System, and in his 30s, he achieved star status, anointed by the literary establishment as the best novelist of his generation. All of this was done while he struggled with addiction to alcohol, marijuana, and opioids. Wallace's immersion in the pressures that accompany success drove his need for narcotizing, and he recognized this need as widely shared. As he shows in Infinite Jest, dubbed by Newsweek magazine his, quote, grating American novel. Our competitive status conscious world catalyzes a widespread need to drink, snort, and shoot up. This self-medicating is a means of survival until, for too many, it becomes the opposite. Combining empathy, originality, and sociological insight, Wallace probes our cultural wounds with unique expertise. Language makes each of his characters rare and memorable, whether they're descriptions by others or their own idiomatic speech. And here I'm just going to skip to my last three quotes for the sake of time. Uh, Wallace's skill in rendering the speech of the heterogeneous humanity that exists at the center of a budding addiction crisis is evident in these next three slides. And I'm just going to read um, through each of them. The first is the doctor. The doctor hadn't even pretended to try to take notes on all this. He couldn't keep himself from trying to determine whether the ambient insincerity the patient seemed to project during what appeared clinically to be a significant gamble and move toward trust and self-revealing was in fact projected by the patient or was somehow counter-transferred or projected onto the patient from the doctor's own psyche out of some sort of anxiety over the critical therapeutic possibilities her revelation of concern over drug use might represent. This next one is the rehab counselor. And this is a series of propositions about addiction. That nobody who's ever gotten sufficiently addictively enslaved by a substance to need to quit the substance and has successfully quit it for a while and been straight and but then has, for whatever, for whatever reason, gone back and picked up the substance again, has ever reported being glad that they did it, used the substance again, and gotten re-enslaved. That other people can often see things about you that you yourself cannot see, even if those people are stupid. That everybody is identical in their secret, unspoken belief that way deep down, they are different from everyone else. And finally, here's the patient. If you sit up front and listen hard, all the speaker's stories of decline and fall and surrender are basically alike and like your own. Fun with the substance, then very gradually less fun, then significantly less fun because of like blackouts you suddenly come out of on the highway going 145 kph with companions you do not know, Nights you awake from in unfamiliar bedding next to somebody who doesn't even resemble any known sort of mammal. Therapeutic self-consciousness, as many in this audience know, can be a paralyzing form of expertise. But Wallace leaves room for hope. The doctor's uncertainty about where his own subjectivity ends and that of the patient begins is potentially humanizing leading perhaps to greater empathy between doctor and patient. The passages from the perspectives of counselor and patient further reveal the ongoing lessons in democracy provided by the cycle of addiction. The perpetual tension in infinite jest is between being special versus accepting one's place in the horde, between distinction and extinction. Wallace presents this essentially democratic conundrum, the desperate ongoing effort to be a one among the many, as central to addiction. 
to recognize addiction as democratizing, afflicting families, friends, and colleagues, is not to preclude another meaning of democratic, the valuing of individuality. As Walt Whitman wrote in Democratic Vistas, quote, to democracy, the leveler, the unyielding principle of the average, is surely joined another principle, equally unyielding, closely tracking the first, indispensable to it, opposite. This second principle is individuality. Democratizing our understanding of addiction by recognizing its pervasiveness allows us to save lives. But beyond this lies another democratic ideal, that every sufferer represents an individual life unknown to us. If saving people requires acknowledgement of their common humanity, keeping them saved requires respecting the distinctiveness of every human life and story. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in the uh, reasonably hallowed tradition of my profession as a historian, I'm going to begin with a story of someone who's um, been entirely forgotten and uh, a story that I think bears some recovering. Emmanuel Weiss was a physician and a botanist. He was born in Austria at the turn of the 19th century. He had traveled the world in his capacity as a sailor, but by the summer of 1849, he had arrived in the United States and he was ready to hatch a plan. So, in his travels to China, Weiss had seen the ravages of opium addiction. And as a physician, he was, a, he was disturbed. But as an opportunist, he wondered why Americans, as enterprising as they might be, didn't seize the opportunity to make some money. It was true that the best opium in the entire world was grown in Turkey, in the highlands near the Aegean town of Afyon Shahir, which bestowed the crop opium its name. The addicted men and women of China were making use of the world's second best crop grown in Benares and Bihar in India. And there was some reasonable opium also grown in Upper Egypt as well. But Emmanuel Weiss had read of farmers who had grown good poppy crops in uh, England, in Germany, even Pennsylvania. So what was preventing American farmers from outstripping Asian production and making good money at the expense of Britain? Weiss floated the idea in technical journals for the better part of a decade, but no one was particularly interested in the plan. But things began to change in the years after the American Civil War. For one thing, Americans had lost their lucrative cotton exports, and the balance of trade with Britain was falling. But more importantly, there were new markets for opium at home. Addicts still smoked the stuff in China, as well as in Chinatowns up and down the West Coast. But now white Americans were just as hungry for opium as well. Soldiers returning home from the Civil War had come back with the promise of morphine to dull their battle scars. And the invention of the hypodermic needle in 1853 gave them a new and more efficient way to take it. But most importantly for Emmanuel Weiss, there were new spaces for cultivation in the great American West. At the end of the war, the botanist traveled to the new territory of Arizona. The land there reminded him of the fields in Turkey and in India where peasants scored poppies for their tacky gum. And his plan came together. If the government would grant him a large land concession, he would ask Greek peasants from Smyrna to bring their opium cultivation expertise back to the United States. Newly freed blacks from the American South would come as well and make Arizona the opium capital of the world. They would sell, of course, directly to addicts, but also to the pharmaceutical companies turning raw opium into morphine and other medicines. I bring up Emmanuel Weiss's plan, uh, which failed miserably when it was introduced in the United States Capitol, not merely because historians are professionally obligated to dredge up every kind of failed scheme, but I think it's because the world he lived in was not entirely dissimilar from our own. Emmanuel Weiss saw Americans who had many different uses for a substance, pharmaceutical and otherwise, and was puzzled by the scheme of imports and exports that moved them from Asian fields into American bodies. And he wondered if it wouldn't simply make more sense to produce these dangerous but often useful drugs at home. And Weiss hadn't been the first person to ask that question. In fact, it had come up the very first time that Europeans had even encountered opium in Asia, 
The Portuguese explorer Alfonso de Albuquerque had asked a similar question as Weiss in 1513, after meeting Indians who drank opium water from vessels like that that you see on the, on the right. He requested Dom Manuel to authorize the import of a man who knows how to work a fium, and for the best poppies from the Azores to be taken and grown uh, in por across Portugal. That question, though, had become more and more important in the, and, and urgent in the 1860s and 70s, as Americans grew increasingly concerned with questions of safety, purity, and distance. There were new, uh, I've gone to, there were new technologies like uh, aluminum cans, steamships, refrigerated rail cars that were bringing useful products of uncertain origin into American pantries and medicine cabinets. And Americans confronted new anxieties about what relationship these products bore to their place of origin. These were the same years in which Americans were growing addicted to opiates in great numbers for the first time, even if medical specialists preferred terms like opiocapnism, op opiophagism, morphinism, or even heroinism. Now, Weiss's era was uh, an era wherein the new questions of abuse, abuse, and addiction were dovetailing with larger concerns about markets, trade, and how the worlds of production and consumption were interlinked in complex ways. And this, I believe, is an insight that's worth recovering now, particularly in a year when more Americans have died from opioids than HIV, car crashes, or gun, gun deaths. Now, if historians do anything well, it's, call attention, it's calling attention to moments where standard narratives either contradict one another or where they don't fit with the best evidence at hand. And journalists writing on the contemporary crisis have appeared to settle on two incorrect and contradictory narratives in their accounts of the, of the epidemic and its origins. The first zeroes in on uh, physicians and pharmaceutical companies who midwife the rise of opioid abuse in the United States. The journalist Brian Goldstone summarizes these narratives succinctly. He says, pressured, manipulated, or otherwise bought off by the pharmaceutical industry, medical providers got millions of patients hooked on pain pills. These patients soon craved the high of cheaper and deadlier drugs, such as heroin. The second narrative, links opioid fatalities to, to broader crises of poverty, deindustrialization, and inequality, casting these as either co uh, correlates or preconditions for opioid addiction. Deaths like these are what the Princeton economist Dan Case and Angus Deaton have described as deaths of despair. And these accounts are often racially uh, linked. Uh, they link opioids to a rising white male mortality rate in the United States. The biggest problem with both of these narratives is that neither really holds up under any great scrutiny and even less so when read together. The prescription of opioids in the United States did skyrocket over the last three decades, but, uh, but in 2010, high-dose prescriptions began to taper off, and overdose deaths from non-prescription drugs like heroin or fentanyl or carfentanil began to rise dramatically instead. So in other words, that wasn't pharmaceutical companies or doctors anymore. Those deaths also came at a time when the United States was beginning to recover from the Great Depression, uh, Great Recession, rather. It might be tempting for us then to blame uh, rising inequality instead, but another team of economists at Princeton has demonstrated that there's no simple causal relationship between economic condi conditions and uh, abuse of opioids. So if fools rush in where angels fear to tread, historians can also do that for economists. And historians have told us a great deal about the long story of opioid addiction uh, in the late 19th and 20th centuries the complicated relationship between the American government and pharmaceutical companies, the rise of therapeutic communities, maintenance treatment, harm reduction approaches. Anthropologists have also taught us a great deal about the social worlds of addiction and use. But what we really lack now is an understanding of where these substances come from, or in other words, a political economy of opioids in the 20th century that unpacks a world of trade, markets, law, and medicine Every bit as complicated as that which Emanuel Weiss had surveyed 150 years ago. That's the work that I've been taking on in archives in uh, India, in Turkey, Australia, Europe, and here in the United States. And these are the broad stories, uh, contours of the story that the archives tell. And the story, of course, begins with a plant. Until the advent of synthetic opioids, pharmaceutical manufacturers relied upon a requisite but unstable supply of alkaloids, all derived from poppies. Peasants around the world followed a similar process to extract opium gum from capsules, lancing poppies in the fields over days and weeks, and slowly collecting the resin that accrued. And for manufacturers, the biggest concern was always labor. The holy grail of production was the promise of an extraction without the need to cut and score poppies, 
a project which would have vastly reduced the reliance on labor from Asia. A Hungarian chemist devised a workable process for extracting morphine directly from poppy straw in the 1920s, but his method wouldn't become economically viable until at least the 1970s. So in the meanwhile, Turkish and Indian poppy cultivation, like you see here, uh, laborious, risky, confined to a small number of districts in central Anatolia and, North and, and central India, empowered the global production of licit and illicit opioids throughout the first three quarters of the 20th century. Manufacturers often deem the Indian product inferior to the Turkish supply on account of its lower alkaloid content and reserved it for the Chinese market. But when two world wars underscored the fragility of Turkish sources, Indian opium gained a new allure. Uh, it, that role grew much more prominent after the nation's independence. So in 1953, when uh, India entered into the uh, United Nations Opium Protocol, it gained a most favored status uh, alongside Turkey for the supply of raw opium. Now, 15 years after that, Richard Nixon's efforts to stamp out the Tur Turkish heroin production resulted in a very brief global shortage of basic medicines. So for a moment, the American Medical Association wondered whether or not American patients would even have access to codeine-based cough syrups. So in an effort to stave off future shortages, the United States in 1981 mandated that 80% of pharmaceutical uh, imports of opioids come, would come from traditional producers, that is to say, India and Turkey. That timing, I don't think, was a coincidence. The early 1980s was also the restive moment where we can discern the earliest contours of the modern American crisis. Against the backdrop of widespread deindustrialization, pain was beginning to emerge as a new metric in care, described as the fifth vital sign that practitioners were supposed to monitor. And for the first time, these familiar cards were printed, showing a series of increasingly agonized cartoon faces by which patients were asked to measure their own level of pain. And opioids suddenly had a new place of pride in the treatment of pain after the 1980 publication of a short letter in the New England Journal of Medicine that practitioners and pharmaceutical representatives misread as suggesting that opioids were often safe for home use. That story has been very well told by journalists. But the supply side of the opioid crisis still remains untold. By the 1980s, Americans were consuming nearly all of the world's Indian and Turkish opium. But Turkish producers were moving towards the direct manufacture of alkaloids from concentrated poppy straw, that process which people had imagined 70 years before. Indian producers uh, grimaced at these new developments, but both Indian and Turkish producers found new and common cause in resisting the encroach of the new Tasmanian poppy industry. Australians had uh, experimented uh, uh, with crop developments in the 1960s, but, they were, but, but the island off Australia was fast emerging as a formidable competi competitor to the traditional producers, and it had a team of lawyers to match. And the biggest changes were yet to come. As lawsuits and trade battles roared, roared in Washington, the question began to emerge as to how important poppy was to be in the, in the management of American pain, if it was at all. Semi-synthetic opioids, compounds that derive from opium alkaloids, like thebane, had been available to druggists since the synthesis of heroin in 1874. And you see an early bottle from Bayer on the left. And a slew of semi-synthetic and still familiar opioids like oxycodone and hydrocodone were synthesized by German chemists over the following decades. And while morphine and codeine still remained essential to the American apothecary, these semi-synthetic compounds had grown in importance throughout the 20th century, with an increasing percentage of the global morphine supply being used to produce them. By the 1930s, new and fully synthetic compounds like pethidine had been developed, which activated the same molecular receptors as poppy-based opioids. It took a while for lab-manufactured drugs like methadone or buprenorphine to gain acceptance for use in opioid replacement therapy. But it was also fully synthetic drugs like fentanyl and carfentanil, alongside drugs like heroin, that Americans began to turn to in the second half of the 2010s. India and Turkey play little or maybe even no role in the last wave of this crisis, where producers in China and Mexico have picked up, picked up the slack, smuggling minute quantities in cat food packaging, for instance, with often lethal consequences. So the type of historical approach that I'm envisioning and working on doesn't substitute in any way for the harm reduction strategies or the sensible uh, juridical or, uh, approaches or medication-assisted uh, treatment that would be at the center of any good plan to meet the opioid crisis head on. 
But as a historian, I think that an effort to unpack the intertwined history of supply and demand offers us new insight into the origins of this crisis and hints at a certain number of ways forward. Writing a transnational history of the opioid crisis means looking for clues in very unexpected places. One such place is here on the left. It's a small private archive in Sitamau town in central India, where the papers of Indian opium merchants are gathering dust. The world of uh, the opioid crisis looks very different from this dry stretch in the Malva Plateau. Traders wonder what regulation in faraway places like Vienna or Washington means for their business. The incipient opioid crisis also looks different from the Ankara offices of the TMO, which is the soil products agency of the Turkish government that regulates the cultivation and then the export of poppies from Anatolia. So in this story, as uh, in all projects of historical recovery, we find that relatively small decisions and conflicts have outsized and unexpected impact. A good, uh, good year in a single Indian district leads to an unexpected glut in the American stockpile. A surging demand for fentanyl in Mississippi leads to the building and then the discovery of a clandestine laboratory in Wuhan province in China. Each of these pieces are, 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 each of these are pieces in a larger global opioid system where demand, supply, and labor are connected in complex and moving ways. When I describe this work to other historians, they often suggest that the global world of opioids looks very similar to the political and economic uh, uh, life of another commodity, sugar, which remade bodies, uh, uh, economies, medicine, and trade in an earlier era of history. There's a lot of truth to that comparison. There's many important differences. But I'll leave us here with the thought that the world of opioids and their supply remains in many ways no less opaque uh, to us than it did to Emmanuel Weiss when he made his proposal 150 years ago. And if opioids have once again crossed over into the terrain of crisis, there's much historical work that we can and should do to help forge our way forward. Thank you. If nothing else, there will be uh, three styles of speaking <laughs> this evening. I'll be bringing a health perspective to bear. In 10 minutes, 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you what addiction is, why it happens, the health consequences, and what we should do about it. Drug use exists on a spectrum represented on this triangle, from none at the bottom to lower risk use in the middle to use that risks health consequences. And then for a minority, a minority, drug use disorder or addiction, I'm going to use those terms equivalently. Addiction is defined by consequences. We don't have a test for it, but we can, we can recognize it when we see the consequences and it's use beyond one's own control. Use despite problems, despite knowing that you're having consequences of that use in your job, in your relationships, in your family. Uh, physical problems and psychological problems. Substances with addictive potential work in the reward center, fundamental to the survival of the species. There are biological reasons why we like drugs. And I'm going to show you some graphs from rat experiments. When rats eat, they have a rise in dopamine. Eating is pleasurable. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's in the reward center of the brain. The rise with sex is a little bit higher. You can see on the scale on the left-hand side there. It's similar, similar level with morphine. With amphetamine, it's much higher, about ten time, five to 10 times higher than it is with any natural stimulus. People use again to try to repeat that experience, although they usually never achieve that same initial experience again. Now, regular use over time leads to changes in the brain. So I told you about one-time use, now I'm talking about regular use. Among people who don't use cocaine, brain signal intensity in the reward pathway is low when they watch a film about cocaine. And that's in the white bars on the left-hand side. And it's high when they watch an erotic film. This is normal. And those are represented in the yellow bars. But among those who regularly use cocaine, they respond to the cocaine film, but they no longer respond to an erotic film. This is where the idea of drugs hijacking the brain partly comes from. Now this is where lab rats live. It's lonely, 
and it's unpleasant. This is Rat Park. You can see on the bottom here that it's nicer. Rats use more drugs when they're caged than when they're in a nice place with their friends. This suggests that there's a social component to addiction. So a couple slides on biology and something else about social. Now, does this happen in people? When soldiers went to Vietnam and developed heroin addiction for the first time there under terrible circumstances and then returned to the United States, only 10% of them had addiction eight to 10 months later. And that's mostly without treatment. However, there were people in the United States who, while living in the United States under difficult social circumstances, developed addiction, and they still had active addiction six months later, 70% after treatment. So 70% still had addiction after treatment. 10% of the first group I described only had addiction almost a year later without treatment. These examples suggest socioeconomic and psychological factors are at play. Addiction is caused about 50% by environment, including the home, uh, the community, policies, uh, and 50% genetics and biology. By the way, just like type 2 diabetes. Now, drugs, despite having strong biological effects, are not the main cause of addiction. And yes, you heard me right. Drugs are not the main cause of addiction. What proportion of people who use a particular substance develop addiction to it? Anywhere from only about 5 to 30 percent. And the majority of people who try a substance, even the majority of people who try heroin, do not develop addiction. So that's the backdrop, a little bit about addiction, why it happens, and what it looks like. Um, and now to opioids. We have an epidemic. 10 million people are misusing prescription opioids. That's the blue line on the top, which, by the way, looks kind of flat. And heroin has increased, that's the red line on the bottom, to about 1 million people using heroin over the past decade. But we don't just worry about drug use, because remember I told you there's use and risky use that isn't the same as addiction. We're worried uh, about consequences as well. Aside from, uh, uh, sorry, we have 70,000 drug, about 70,000 drug overdose deaths. This is the latest count estimated from uh, the Center for Disease Control in the U.S. each year. Now, not all of those are from opioids. About two-thirds of them are from opioids. There has been a run, actually, not from, I should say. They involve opioids. They involve other substances as well. But opioids are present in two-thirds. There's been a rise in deaths due to the more dangerous forms of opioids, which is alluded to in the prior talk. Like, uh, the potent, uh, like heroin first, and then now potent synthetic drugs like fentanyl. Now, aside from overdose, and this is a brief slide on health consequences, aside from overdose and intoxication uh, that can cause injury, the main other health consequences of opioids uh, are from how they're used and not the drugs themselves. With alcohol, for example, it's actually from the alcohol itself that you get cirrhosis or pancreatitis or one of those things. With opioids, there are a few direct medical consequences. They come from use, and these, this is a photo of needles um, used just a few times on the right-hand side, used six times. They get dirty, they wear out uh, with repeated use. So what are the consequences of that? Well, if you inject in your neck, which I've seen on Albany Street in the middle of the day in Boston, um, they can cause your lung to collapse. Injection anywhere else can transmit infection like of heart, disease, heart valves or, or other serious infections like HIV and hepatitis. This um, is... Very good, all right, thank you. Jim Morrison, who died of overdose at age 27, cocaine and heroin. Prince, uh, fentanyl, Amy Winehouse, alcohol overdose, age 28. And this? They never remember the tenured English professors. Sorry. Uh, it's uh, Omar Castaneda. Um, and uh, he was a tenured professor of English, winning, uh, or award-winning fiction writer. The point of putting these up uh, is that they, are, they were productive despite uh, addiction and mostly uh, died young. On average, Overdose from opioids is associated with 46 years, this is a public health measure, YPLL, years of potential life lost for each death. Now, what can we do about opioid addiction and overdose? 
Well, making drugs illegal hasn't worked and doesn't work. Historically, we've made drugs illegal not based on the potential for harm, but instead based on who's using particular drugs. Minorities and immigrants have been targeted. Here, although use is similar among whites and blacks, drug-related ar arrests are much higher among blacks. The US has the highest incarceration rate in the world. So what should, higher than Russia and China. So what should we do about opioid addiction? Four things. Reduce harms for those who use, treat those with addiction, reduce availability, and prevent addiction before it begins. So for reducing harms for those who use, needle exchange reduces HIV transmission and other infectious diseases. Supervised in injection facilities, which we don't have in the United States, can reduce infections and overdose. Naloxone can reverse an overdose, uh, and uh, uh, although the, the governor of Maine has said that um, he doesn't really see the point in that because they'll just do it again, uh, but I tend to look at this that, as saving a life that um, can then be saved again. Um, these are people in recovery, and this is what happens uh, when you treat folks. Uh, ben Affleck, Bradley Cooper, Betty Ford before her death in 2011, Martin Sheen, Drew Barrymore, Daniel Radcliffe, Elton John, 90% of people with addiction don't receive treatment, but people can get into recovery and treatment is effective. We should uh, be treating them. We've known for 53 years that the most efficacious treatments for opioid addiction are long-acting opioids. Methadone is the one that's 53 years old and then more recently buprenorphine. They work in part by preventing euphoria and withdrawal from illicit opioids and they reduce HIV transmission increase employment. That's a medical treatment that as a result of a medical treatment increases uh, employment, reduces crime, prevents death. Yet their availability is limited and society stigmatizes not only those with addiction but those in treatment. This is the front page of the Boston Herald. They outed people with addiction who were going to get their treatment before work. This was around the time of the big dig. Um, and the, the treatment that they're getting, the only way they can get it is by going to a clinic that's highly regulated and the rule is that they must go once a day to get their medication at that clinic in person. Imagine if you had to go to a clinic and line up every day to get your blood pressure medication, every single day to get a dose, or your birth control pills, every single day to get a dose, and then end up on the front page of the Herald. Third is reduce availability. Now the main approach to the epidemic thus far, because I think it's easiest and because it seems obvious, has been to focus on prescription opioids. Prescribing did increase dramatically as we entered the 21st century. Enough opioids are prescribed every year to medicate everyone in the US around the clock for a month. There's no question that such availability and access plays into which drugs people use. Making them less available can lead to less use of those drugs. Prescription takebacks, turning in unused medications, prescription monitoring programs that allow doctors to see prescriptions received by patients, and physician training can all reduce prescribing and availability of legal prescribed opioids. But there's harm to patients with pain who don't have addiction, and very few people with no prior addiction develop it de novo from legitimate opioid prescribing for pain. The focus on prescription opioids is really like looking for your keys because that's where the light is. If we restrict access to these drugs, people will use other, more dangerous ones. Overdose deaths will not decline, nor will rates of addiction. That was a prediction a few years ago, and now we're seeing it because a lot of these things are in place and not much has changed. Now, if prescription drugs were causing an addiction epidemic, then we would see addiction rising. But it isn't. If you look at the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, in 2002, about 9% of people in the population had alcohol or other drug use disorder. And the number's about the same, although the methodology changed. It's lower, if anything. About the same in 2016. And in Massachusetts, on the left, in this figure, in the hint of where to look is where that big red arrow is, only about 20% only about 20%, that blue line on the bottom, of opioid deaths have prescription opioids present. The rest are other, more accessible now, more dangerous drugs. And the last thing we have to do is prevent addiction. And that, this is sort of consistent with the steady prevalence of addiction. We can't address 
opioid addiction by focusing on opioids. That sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? We can't address opioid addiction by focusing on opioids alone. Essentially, all people with opioid addiction used other drugs first. Prevention needs to focus on the most common substances, alcohol, tobacco, nicotine, e-cigarettes, and cannabis. School, family, and community-based prevention programs have efficacy. They address risk and protective factors. And societal interventions like taxes and sales and advertising restrictions for legal substances, alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis, are among the most effective strategies. Together, these approaches that are more far-reaching and go across substances will be effective. Instead of just playing whack-a-mole, focusing on one drug, leading people to simply use another one without preventing any addiction or reducing health harms. The opioid crisis isn't just about opioids. Thank you. We will take questions. <laughs> so I hold it. OK. Um, so you talked about drug education. Um, and I was wondering if you thought that it should be more like ideal sex education where it's teaching you how to do something safely instead of teaching abstinence, which doesn't really work. Right, so actually, I, I don't think I talked about drug education. Um, what I meant to say, at least, is about uh, prevention programs. And the prevention programs that work, uh, at, that are school-based prevention programs, don't usually, um, it, it's not uh, psychoeducation. Um, they're usually aiming to support uh, protective factors that youth may have, like um, uh, having dinner at home with family and um, basically social factors that can prevent people from developing addiction um, and looking for risk factors, kids who may not be doing so well in school. And then there are these programs that help support um, negotiating what you want to do. That is, if somebody is offering you drugs, that they help negotiate drug refusal, for example, if that's what you'd like to do. And that's the nature of those, uh, those sorts of programs. They're not really education. I mean, you can see you, that we fall into a, a trap every generation, maybe, or every time there's new, a new crisis with a new drug, whether it be cannabis or e-cigarettes or, or um, opioids, that uh, we'll do like a health education class and that that's going to solve the problem. Or like the uh, FDA just released yesterday, I don't know how many of you saw um, a video of, to, to encourage teenagers to not use e-cigarettes. And the videos are teens use, inhaling from an e-cigarette and then it shows worms crawling under the skin over their face. And it turns out that teenagers are well aware that if they use an e-cigarette, they will not have worms crawling under their skin. So that doesn't work. It's sort of traditional scare tactics, not helpful. The D.A.R.E. program is an example of one that's been shown to be ineffective and continues to be used nationwide. Hi, I would love for you guys to prove me wrong or tell me that I'm um, really sophomoric in my thinking, but I feel like with any addiction, there's a greater underlying socioeconomic or just like psychological reason for wanting to go down that path that's just not being addressed. And I wonder if any of you guys have seen that in your research um, versus just having a predisposition towards addiction, because I feel like addressing addiction, any kind of education, um, medical treatments is just kind of treating a symptom and not really addressing the cause. So I'm wondering if you guys have seen something, and I feel like that's a very uh, touchy subject to say, you know, you have a really shitty life, so what else do you have to do except to do drugs? Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, one of you guys can prove me wrong on that theory. They're looking at me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a health response. Okay, sure. Uh, yeah, not at all sophomoric. Uh, 
the, the, I think the complexity is that there isn't one single socioeconomic factor that ends up predisposing any particular individual, right? Um, and as I said, about 50% of addiction is, is related to environment and socioeconomics um, and psychological factors and about 50% to genetics. You have to try a drug before you can develop addiction to it and the biology may determine how you respond to it and there's no question that that's there and it may determine how hard it is uh, for you to stop uh, once you develop addiction. But I wouldn't say that there's a uh, no, I should say that there's, um, uh, all those other factors are important in did you try the drug, are you continuing to use it, are you um, using a substance initially to try to medicate some symptom which might be anxiety or depression or pain or, or something. Um, so that's definitely a factor. Um, I, I'd also say that in treatment you want to take all treatments that work. And for some addictions, and for opioid addiction, opioid um, agonist treatment is very efficacious, but it also allows you to then get psychological counseling for other issues um, that might be going on, because if you're continuing to use heroin six times a day by injection, you can't really participate in much counseling. So the combination of a medication that can keep you from using illicit substances um, and allow you to then go and address other issues. Although again, I don't think there's, you're gonna find one particular cause, uh, but to address many of those other issues is, is what the next steps are. Yeah, you can. I would just, um, um, and this, this connects a little bit with, with um, Susan's focus on some of the literature around the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, when the first wave of literature came out from journalists and others, journal journalists, memoirists who were writing opioid narratives, mm -hmm. there was a focus on exactly what you're talking about, on this, on, on this correlation between uh, economic distress and on um, uh, use and abuse of opioids and others, and opioids, alcohol, other substances. Um, it was a seductive, and it remains a very seductive narrative, in part because they are often correlated in very visual ways. Um, the data, as it started to come out from what I encountered, maybe it's different than, than, than what you've seen, it seems to suggest, though, that it's not, it's not as straightforward or, or as pat as that. Mm -hmm. um, and what um, the, best, the best evidence that I, I encountered um, was a series of uh, working papers from the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, one of which I, I mentioned earlier very quickly that said there wasn't a simple correlation between socio so socioeconomic conditions and, uh, and, and opioid use, and that while it might be good to, um, while there were many reasons to combat uh, inequality, to combat uh, 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 situations of economic distress, um, it wasn't necessarily the case that they would immediately ameliorate uh, use, and, use and abuse of, of opioids. The second working paper said that the single largest uh, factor uh, that impacted opioid use was the availability of opioids in different forms, be that um, uh, through prescriptions or more, you know, or increasingly through, um, through other means. So I, I, I think that the narratives, um, and they were important narratives to write, conditioned our thinking a little strongly, um, uh, and that it's important for us to look for other variables. Uh, yeah, and, and I would just add here that, you know, if, if you can look at a literary work like David Foster Wallace's Infinite Jest is a kind of um, collection of data, you know, literary data, so to speak. I mean, I think one of its messages is that, you know, every class you can identify, you know, every sphere of the society has, you know, plen plenty of people, you know, plenty of addictive behavior. And so um, it's not confined and it's not limited by, you know, these kinds of economic or environmental, you know, factors that. Um, you know, anim analysts might point to. I mean, you have this, you know, in his, in, in the novel, you have wealthy kids, you know, at a prep school. You have, um, you know, just homeless people, um, you know, on the Charles River. You have um, people from every socioeconomic group, from every, um, you know, sort of, you know, vocation you can, you can imagine. Um, and, you know, all of these people are, you know, suffering in different ways from, you know, uh, addiction. So I, I think that, you know, one of his, this idea of democratizing, I mean, one of the uh, points, you know, I'm really trying to emphasize here is that, uh, you know, one of the things, that, tendencies, I think, in uh, an earlier literature has been to other addiction, you know, and to believe that addiction is about other people. It's about um, people who are not like us. And I think um, this 1997 novel, 
uh, infinite jest, you know, is already telling us that it is all of us uh, and that we're all experiencing this. And this is, you know, just a kind of pervasive, uh, you know, predicament, you know, uh, of American society, you know, in, in the 1990s. So it's, you know, I, I, I think that, um, you know, this, this is one of the key points that's being made here. When I said social factors, by the way, I didn't mean poor. So when I agree with you, I'm talking about uh, home, what the home is like, psychological factors, uh, maybe experienced trauma in the past, those sorts of things uh, that happen to people who are both rich and poor. Um, hi, I'm from Boston Healthcare for the Homeless. And um, I did a, um, a workshop for our um, in-house people this Monday on, um, on stigma towards homelessness and, the op and uh, being, being addicted to drugs. Um, in your professional opinion, do you think stigma has a lot to do with it? Because when I interviewed a lot of our patients and everything, they did say that the stigma did hold them back into going for treatment or, or asking for treatment and things like that. Is there something from the novel? Or? Oh, I could, but you should, you should start. <laughs> sure, uh, yeah, I think, I think stigma plays a big role. It's in the language um, that we use. People are called abusers or users rather than people who use drugs um, or a person who has a family and is using drugs. Uh, and I do think that uh, nobody wants, I mean, the, the photo that I showed from the Boston Herald is simply awful. I mean, these are people with full-time jobs who are doing what they're supposed to be doing to get the best help they can for their, for their illness, and, um, and they're put on the front page of the Herald and shamed uh, as if they're doing something wrong. So I do think it plays a big role, and one way that we can uh, help with that, I think, is using accurate language um, to describe the, the condition and the people with it. Moore has a book out on languages you should not use yeah. towards an um, a addicted person, yeah. or, or languages you should use instead mm -hmm. of certain words, you should use other words. And they yeah. put out a national uh, book on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, one of the words that you really are not supposed to use is addict, in the same way that uh, the term slave is repudiated. I mean, you know, to the extent that we 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 continue to have a worldwide slavery problem, uh, you you use the word enslaved. In, in other words, you describe a condition as opposed to stigmatizing the individual by attaching a permanent label or a kind of identifying label. One question I have for you: Do do, do people in in your um, in your institution know David Foster Wallace? Do they read him? I'm just curious. I, I don't think any of our patients yeah. have read him. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I was because I would buy a book for your place just to have right. it, it. This is this is essential reading. I mean, if 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 my uh, you know talk has any any purpose at all, it's just to get people to read this novel because it really is. It's very long, unfortunately, but it's an astonishing portrait of the various you know worlds of addiction in this in this culture. Um, I was going to ask you afterwards if I can get like, like those slides of what mm -hmm. you've shown because I think, mm -hmm. I don't think our people would read the whole book, but, <laughs> but if we get uh, <laughs> portions of yeah. it, yeah. I think they yeah. uh, would read it, yeah. or if we put portions okay. up on a bulletin board. Uh -huh. there you go. Okay, I'll, I'll get them for you. <laughs> oh, hi. So uh, my name is Aiden, um, and you said that there was not a like clear connection between like or not there in poor communities. There's not higher opioids, but it just seems so clear to me that um, in you don't go around certain parts of Boston and seeing everyone shooting up in the neck. It's only in certain areas, and those areas tend to be poor and have uh, you know less money in them in general. And when that happens, there's 
uh, a more likelihood for people to want to make money uh, in an illegal way selling drugs, and you see more drugs available on the streets. You walk down past Boston Medical, and there you can just about get heroin anywhere, and there's needles on the streets everywhere. Uh, and when you're growing up in a community like that, uh, with m less money, and you're seeing just drugs all around you all the time, and I don't know if you've ever talked to anyone uh, or talked to the guy that was shooting up in the neck, but I've talked to a few, and these guys grow up with their parents as users as well. And it's just growing up with it all around you. And <clears throat> someone like me or most of us who grows up in a, a you know, middle class or even wealthy family, our parents aren't using that, and it's not all over the streets. It's not all around my community or my house. You know. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that uh, what's around you affects what you do and what's available. So there's a lot of factors that come to play there, right? Availability uh, plus other, other circumstances. That said, and I, I work there every day on that corner. Um, and yeah, I've talked to people there um, a lot. Um, and I also have colleagues who live in Needham and Newton and ambulances drive by and pick up dead bodies from houses from people who've overdosed. So I, I, it, it happens everywhere. There's no question that, um, that it's very visible in some places. It's visible in poorer communities where people congregate and have no place else to go, as opposed to where it's more hidden in, uh, in higher income communities. Uh, but, uh, and, and there's also no question that, the, that your social context in your neighborhood affects things like availability, access, choices, lots of things. So I, I think your observations are, are true. Um, it's, it's just that it happens elsewhere too. I wonder if you feel that the government has some responsibility for the crisis in that hospitals are dinged. They're not paid if men, too many of their patients complain of a high degree of pain. So that instead of being post-surgical, and, and uh, comfortable with a pain level of four or five, they strive to get zero or one, and then they're sent home with a prescription of 30 oxys so that they don't give a bad rating to the hospital. Yeah, I mean, that's been, I'm gonna turn to Dr. Professor Siegel too, because I think you mentioned the, the, the pain scale. I actually think that, that that has been overplayed as a cause. Um, I think good practice would be to maybe not aim for zero, and certainly good practice would not be to give 30 or 100 extra tablets that nobody's gonna use. Part of the reason that's not good practice is because people don't use them, and then they're sitting in the medicine cabinet, and then someone can try them. And one of the biggest risk factors for addiction is early onset of use of an addictive substance. The earlier you use, the more likely you are to develop addiction later. Um, I, the, most of the people given uh, uh, opioids in hospitals for acute pain, are the vast majority are not gonna develop addiction unless they already had addiction, and then that's not developing addiction. That's, that's something else. So I, I think it plays a role in terms of access and availability, and it probably did contribute to over-prescribing but the effect of, I think, what we're seeing in this opioid epidemic now is caused by lots of things, and that just plays one role in making medications more available. You know, I, I agree with that, and I, this, this is not a core focus of what my research is, but looking at that moment in the early 1980s when pain became a metric, uh, and an important one, and tools uh, to measure pain uh, came into being, I. I it's certainly a vital turning point, and I think what's going on behind the scenes with availability is just as important as that story. I think that it's probably been overplayed too. I, mm -hmm. I wonder whether, and Professor Mizruku could speak a little more about this, mm -hmm. there's, there's such a long literature coming out of English, mm -hmm. coming out of anthropology, coming out of other social science and humanistic fields uh, that asks this question of what is pain and how do we communicate it to other people? And yeah. the, well, I, I was actually thinking of Elaine Scarry's work um, when you were talking when you were talking about the '80s, you know, in particular. And, and actually, but the one thing I would say about uh, it's a it's a wonderful book called *The Body in Pain*, um, published in 1981. Uh, but uh, in some ways, more relevant than that book to this discussion is Elaine Scarry's work on 
drug advertisements. She's just absolutely incredible work. And one of the things that she shows, and this is going on in the early 80s, is um, this dramatic contrast between drug advertisements in mass media magazines that are you know, directed at general audiences and drug advertisements in medical journals that are directed at doctors. And what is just so alarming um, ab about you know, her um, analysis, and she j just does in-depth, brilliant uh, interpretations of these advertisements. I mean, she reads the images. Um, is how pain is represented, you know, to the medical doctors as, you know, just um, dramatic, excruciating. And it, it, listening to you, it's, it's hard for me to believe that, uh, I mean, one of the things that, you know, she's making a case for, it seems to me very vividly, is that, in fact, doctors were actively, uh, and, and I think this, this is my sense of the story of, um, you know, Purdue Pharma as well. And, you know, I realize these are journalistic accounts and they, they have their limits, but it does seem to me that a real press, a real push was being made, um, you know, uh, to the medical profession, to market, to, um, you know, to prescribe in, you know, huge numbers um, these medications. So um, whether or not that's a kind of exaggeration, and I can understand why you know, there would be a lot of you know, pushback by the medical profession, but you can identify you know, culturally you know, certain um, trends that really do reinforce what you're asking about here, you know, this kind of um, urgency or motivation to prescribe a lot. And it even occurs to me that you know, an op-ed like the kind we saw um, that was in I think it was either the, the Times or the Globe the other day about, um, you know, this doctor who was, you know, um, I, I think he resigned from, was it MGH? Or, no, no, it was, it was uh, Sloan Kettering um, because, uh, you know, there were questions about his connections to pharmaceutical companies. I mean, this, surely this issue is, you know, problematic and, and whether or not it's, it's exaggerated or only part of the story, um, I guess it's hard you know, not to think about that, um, given the way that's played up, and you know, in the press, and maybe you, um, you know, Rich, as, as someone who works in the medical profession and and works in the ground zero of these issues, you may have a sense too about why um, we're constantly fed these kinds of inflamed accounts. I mean, there is a kind. You, you could say that one of the um, you know, one of the, the mottos of journalism these days is don't let the doctors get away with it or <laughs> something. I mean, is it your sense? Am I, am I that, that there is a kind of, uh, you know, focus on? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the, uh, there's, there was no question that there was, well, for, the way this started was people weren't getting pain treated. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of people in pain. Doctors were ignoring people right. in pain. So then uh, the idea was let's get doctors to treat pain. So they dutifully followed. Um, and then the drug companies did take advantage, uh, and I think that did lead to overprescribing. So there's no question that there was too much, it, it, the pendulum swung, mm -hmm. and then there was too much prescribing. I think all of that is true. The question is, does that cause addiction? Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah. And I, I don't think it, most, mostly it yeah. doesn't. Now, one of the reasons that it's complex and appears yeah. like it might cause addiction yeah. is that a lot of that pres prescribing mm -hmm. ends up being to people who have addiction. Mm -hmm. And that's because when doctors prescribe, they didn't check to see if their patients might have addiction mm -hmm. uh, or if they were predisposed to addiction before prescribing. Mm -hmm. and, it's comp and, it, and it becomes complicated and appears mm -hmm. like a lot of that is associated. But if you go back to, I, I, I've seen many people with, I've treated many people with opioid use disorder, and I can remember one, one who had, I couldn't find any other reason other than she had been exposed to opioids mm -hmm. prescribed by a physician. Mm -hmm. But that's just one out of dozens, hundreds. Um, and it just, it is unusual that that's the sole cause. Mm -hmm. there, there are other unintended consequences that are visible when you take the supply side approach that I'm thinking about. Um, the United States uses almost all of the world's <laughs> supply of opioids. Uh, and so what that means is that it means while we're awash in them and we, we may or may not uh, develop addiction as a result or have, 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 uh, have that present and then have the availability, what it means is that there are basic medicine needs in South Asia where I work, in Africa for palliative care, uh, 
that don't exist. Getting morphine for pain treatment there uh, is nearly impossible, even in cases of advanced cancer or moments when it would be otherwise necessary. That's a consequence that, uh, you know, it's hard to say that's, that's directly a result of our appetite, but certainly is apparent when you start looking at a larger constellation of how medicine is distributed globally. We have time for one more question. I would like to uh, address my question to Professor Siegel, especially building off that point of how use is addressed globally. Um, it seems that one of the things that we're talking about is, is supply and demand or a global supply chain. And so my question is, um, how do you put the pills back in the bottle, to, so to speak, if we're thinking about global interconnectedness and questions of global supply? Um, how do we determine, do we, do we rely on trade partners to maybe de um, provide less of this medication to the U.S. so that there is more of a global supply? And can you see, based on your historian's hunch, maybe something in the past that might be relevant to this future question of restricting the supply to the U.S. in order to push it more globally? Uh, this is where I get to um, beg for my position as a historian and say we only look at the past, so we have no predictive ability whatsoever. I, I will say, though, that, and I mentioned this briefly in passing, um, the, the story of op opium and opioids, and the language has changed and refers to different things in, in the 20th century, uh, reminds a lot of my colleagues, our colleagues, um, of the story of sugar. And what's so interesting is when we think about sugar, the big work on sugar dates to, the well, uh, the way that I'm thinking about dates, dates to the 1970s, when we started thinking about what, um, what uh, uh, African labor in the Americas was doing for consumption in Europe and in, in the United States. And that's when people started to piece the puzzle together and, and, and to examine what the relationship between uh, supply and demand in different markets uh, and sites were. And I would say that then there was maybe a 40-year lag time between that and the moment that the New York Times started printing weekly uh, op-eds on how, uh, uh, how dangerous sugar actually was. Mm. So that was a four-decade lead time. The nice thing about the opioid crisis, if there is it, there's no nice thing about the opioid crisis, but the gratifying thing for us to think about is that the lag time is a little shorter. Our responsiveness is pretty good. Um, if we think of... I think of 1981 and this famous Jix letter as, as round zero of the opioid yeah. crisis. It, it may or may not be, but that's my starting point. Um, but it really brewed into something that we recognize as a crisis by, by, by the turn of the millennium. Um, our responsiveness has been, I think, very quick. Uh, we, we've been within, within a decade and a half uh, even the pain, pain medicine uh, uh, associations that get blamed a lot um, uh, for this in these narratives about pills were responding very quickly to a crisis that had emerged. So that's a long way of saying that I think the recognition of how distribution occurs, whether that's coming from fields and laboratories into bottles or into uh, cat food packages or, and into bodies, um, our awareness of how that system functions is directly tied to our ability to uh, make good policy decisions uh, uh, about it. Yeah. Well, I, let me just add that, you know, I think that the, the issue of responding um, to the crisis has also has had a lot to do um, in the U.S. historically with race and with, you know, the issue of who um, who the, uh, the people who are suffering, you know, from addiction are. And um, that is something um, we're planning to address. I mean, one of the things I would like to just highlight is we are having a major um, event at BU October 12th to 13th, Humanities Approaches to the Opioid Crisis. And I hope all of you here will, um, you know, join us. It's, it's a, uh, an open event, and uh, we would really um, sort of welcome you. So. Um, Please think about uh, you can you can find um, information about this on the um, BU Humanity Center website. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for the wonderful panel. <laughs>